Okay, we are recording right now. Uh, so, talking about Rwanda and the Rwandan genocide. A couple different things that you all should definitely need to know. First and foremost, okay, Rwanda is a tiny little country in the middle of Africa. Okay, uh, Africa, during the age of imperialism, okay, it was called like the race for Africa, the scramble for Africa. Europeans, who are notorious for colonizing crap, okay, went into Africa because they're like, hey, this land's not been claimed, okay? Asia had already been claimed, so you couldn't go to Asia. All the land there was already owned, so to speak, by European powers. North and South America was all claimed and owned by European powers. Africa was a little bit different because it was so dense and hard to get to the middle of. Also, Africa's freaking massive. Because of that, it wasn't really claimed. Can we stay on task, please? You're being recorded. Um, okay. Uh, so we also know. Shut your mouth before I murder you. Joking, joking, totally. Um, I won't actually murder you, and I certainly wouldn't talk about it ahead of time, um, because that is a bigger crime. Uh, okay. So Africa's massive. We're going to get the Berlin Conference. The Berlin Conference is something you want to understand when it's talking about Rwanda. This is when these major European powers in the late 1800s, early 1900s get together and they decide we're going to divide Africa and we're just going to respect each other's boundaries. Okay. Berlin Conference. It is significant to note that no African representatives were present at the Berlin Conference. Okay. It was simply these major European powers. So the Africans don't really have much of a say. The country that ends up with Rwanda is Germany. World War I happens. Germany, despite actually gaining territory, is considered the loser of World War I. Part of the Paris Peace Agreement was that Germany had to uh, give up its overseas colonies. One of those colonies was Rwanda. The Belgians then took over Rwanda. When it's talking about African history and you hear the word the Belgians, okay, think Satan. Truly, okay. In Europe, Belgium's pretty calm. Whenever Europe's in Africa, they do some pretty nasty crap, okay. Think back to King Leopold. We've talked about him. Where was he from? Belgium, okay. Chop, chop on the hands. Not a nice guy. Killed a bunch of people, okay. Um, this is after the time of Leopold, but it's Belgium, okay. Belgium is going to really exploit the difference between Hutu and Tutsi, okay? So we know in Rwanda there's the two primary ethnic groups. We have the Hutu, we have the Tutsi. Tutsi are the smaller group, okay? They're the minority group. They're the ones that have more political power. Traditionally, the Tutsi are cattle farmers, okay? If you were raising cattle, that's going to allow you to make more money. It's also going to allow you um, to have an easier quality of life. The Hutu are the larger ethnic group, predominantly farmers, uh, harder life, okay, less nutrients. It's going to be more of a challenge to live as a farmer than it is to have a cattle, like to raise cattle. Uh, the Belgians, when they get there, are going to heavily exploit this disparity, okay? They're going to reach in and they're going to really promote this. The reason they're going to promote this is a way of gaining power. You want them to be fighting with each other and seeing the other Rwandans as an enemy versus seeing you as the enemy because it allows you to maintain power. The Belgians wanted to hold on to their power. If they do it this way, it's going to allow it to work. So the Belgians put the Tutsi in charge of Rwanda. The education system is going to be teaching uh, in the Tutsi, like in favor of the Tutsis. Stories are told about how the Tutsis are really good, the Hutu are these bad group. Okay, there's more advantage and opportunity for Tutsi than there is for Hutu. Despite the fact that the largest group is the Hutu. Does that make sense? Everyone's okay so far. Okay, uh, now this is going to be a major cause of tension. A lot of um, Hutu are very upset by this, justifiably so. Um, a number of Tutsi kind of take advantage of this, uh, do not treat the Hutu very well, causes a lot of tension. Okay, so this is where that ethnic tension is coming from. 
the uh, it is something I would definitely mention the influence of the Belgians, particularly European col- uh, coloniz- or colonization in Rwanda, and it kind of exacerbating this tension that's already present. Okay, they're making it worse. You could make a pretty legitimate argument that this genocide might not have happened if it were not for the Belgians uh, doing this in the first place. Now, you're going to get this uh, question. There were some, not a large number. Uh, most of them that were there would have been civil servants working for the government, um, similar to like the British were, uh, were in Egypt, stuff like that. Um, so you've got this going on. Okay, You're going to have the Civil War then in the late 50s or early 60s. Um, I don't remember the exact date, where the situation is going to change. The Belgians are going to leave. Uh, the Rwandans are going to have their civil war. The Hutu are going to come out on top. So we now switch government from being controlled by the Tutsis, the minority group, to being controlled by the Hutu, the majority group. Okay, There's a lot of uh, tension going on here. They kind of do the same sort of thing that was happening previously when it comes to education. Uh, they're just going to flip it around. So instead of the uh, Hutu being the target, they're now going to be targeting the Tutsi. Okay, you're going to be getting this kind of system going on. Uh, you're going to have the French playing a large role here because it's a French-speaking country. Uh, you've got those Francophiles, okay, people who love France. Frank, uh, the root of France, okay, file meaning love something. That's why I like pedophile, lover of children. Um, I know that's a weird way, just so you can break down the, the root word here, okay. They're Francophiles. They like the French. Um, you have this go on right through here. Even today, talking about the role of the French in the actual genocide is is contested, um, and there's something there as well. Now, uh, you're going to be getting this sort of system going on. The president, okay, Harvey Armana, is the president of Rwanda. Uh, Harvey Armana is a devout Catholic. He is going to be using his Catholic faith as a way of getting people, um, as a way of getting kind of international support, okay? I'm not a bad guy. I'm just a really good Catholic. Every like, don't worry about the racial policies I'm passing. Look at all these churches I'm building. Look at all these missions I'm building. Different things like that. All right. So he's doing this. Okay. Uh, we're going to get different movements start growing out of this time. We're going to get the Hutu Power Movement. This is an organization that believes that the Hutu should be in power um, and that the Tutsis are really, really bad. Okay. Think nationalism to the extreme. Hutu nationalism to the extreme. We're also going to, going to get the Intera Hamwe. The Intera Hamwe, if we're going to make a comparison to another group, it's kind of like the SA when it comes to the Nazi party. Okay, They're the ones in power. They're the police. They're the ones enforcing this kind of disparity and this, this difference going on between the Hutu and the Tutsi. They're going to be going through with this one. Um, yes, go. Question. Yes. I don't remember the exact uh, acronym. It was the Nazi secret. It was the Nazi party police um, that Hitler took care of in, uh, took care of, got rid of um, their leader, Ernst Rom, <coughs> excuse me, during the Night of the Long Knives. But basically, they're like the, they're kind of like the military branch um, of the Hutu power movement. Um, that's a really oversimplification, but oversimplification is not always a bad thing because it gives you kind of an idea of where you're going. Um Okay, so this is going to be going on right through here as well. Um, we also should be talking and understanding the role of the media. Okay, RTLM, the radio station that was discussed, uh, was this Hutu Hutu radio station. Now, why did they use a radio? It's incredibly easy to transmit radio waves. Okay, you don't need any infrastructure, like physical on the ground infrastructure. If I'm going to be trying to transmit like TV signals, I need to have the um, electricity and stuff going through the ground. I need the wires. I need the satellite dish at this time to pick up the signal um, or the actual on-the-ground hardware. I don't need that with the radio wave. I need a tiny little antenna sticking up on the air and somewhere to shoot the antenna out from or shoot the, the signal out from. Super easy to transmit. It's incredibly cheap to produce radios as well. Um, and the radio will work really anywhere you're at. Okay, So I can broadcast messages to people super, super easily, very efficient. There's a reason okay, Hitler did the same thing when it came to the radio. He made the radio that he gave to everyone. Um, during the Cold War, you've got the United States, okay, Radio Free Europe, where they're promoting radio signals into the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc countries as a way of kind of trying to get them to come around to their side of thinking. 
So we have this radio station. This is where we're going to getting some of those prop or those propaganda messages uh, promoted to them. Okay, things like once a cockroach, always a cockroach. Okay, a cockroach will never be a butterfly. What are they talking about there? Uh, the cockroach symbolizing the Tutsi. Okay, will never be a butterfly. They will never be a Hutu. It's always a bug. Okay, what do you do with cockroaches? They're a pest. You crush them. You get rid of those those pests. Uh, yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, it, this kind of mentality right through here. We're going to be talking about this promotion of this hate-filled ideology. Um, notice they're not going to just immediately start and just go right in, right away, of kill them all. Uh, they're going to kind of work you up to that. Okay, you've got to kind of shift the pendulum just a little bit. It's already shifting in the way of kind of this hatred, um, but you cannot just go straight there or you will not get the people on your side. You've got to go a little bit slow to get them there, and then once it's there, then you pounce. So that's kind of how they're going to be taking this one right through here. Um, initially, it starts off much more uh, kind of controlled, so to speak, than it did towards the middle, beginning, and end of the genocide, where they're giving out the names, information of people who are taking part in the genocide, all of that kind of stuff. Okay? Okay, so that's going to be the role of the media. We can talk about that, understand that. You also get the newspapers that are going to be pushed out at this time. Again, in the DBQ practice from the textbook, um, you saw the one with the cockroach, okay, the symbol or the saying, the, uh, the machete. Okay, the machete is significant. It's going to be the main method of murder during the genocide. It's a farm tool that everyone has access to. It's the primary reason for that. Okay, uh, other causes of the genocide. Um, we have the economic situation. Rwanda was not exactly a very rich country. Um, those that had the majority of the money, though, were the Tutsis. So you do have some of this kind of class uh, class fighting going on as well. You've got the upper class, which would have been the Tutsi, because cattling or raising cattle is going to give you more money. It's going to give you more free time as well. You kind of enjoy a life, life of luxury or relative luxury compared to farming. Um, you've got the colonial legacy going on as well, talking about the Belgians. Um, you get the Rwandan Civil War. Okay, during the Rwandan Civil War, you've got the Hutu fighting for the Tutsi, and the Tutsi kind of fighting to come to power, alt or stay in power. Ultimately, the Hutu will be the ones that come into power. Harbor Armana, okay, you're going to get the formation of the RPF, um, these different organizations right through here. Everyone's good on that so far. Okay, uh, now we're going to get the um, Ashura Accords happening in 1994. This is a way of trying to kind of quell the tension in Rwanda, stop this ethnic tension, and come to a form of peaceful agreement. So you have President Harvey Armana is out of the country. He goes, he signs these accords. As he's coming back into the country, his plane is shot down right before landing. This is significant. Okay, This is kind of the spark in the powder keg. That's the initial thing which starts the actual genocide happening. Okay, This is where it starts happening. Right here. He was killed. Yes. Okay, so the president's plane is shot down. Um, right away, the entire Hamway jump into action and start going door to door. They start setting up roadblocks, stopping the country uh, and really shutting it down. They uh, establish a provisional government, so to speak. Um, the prime minister, she is at her home. Um, the next morning, entire Hamway forces go. Uh, and they kill her. I believe they kill her husband as well. I think her children got out, if I remember right, but I can't remember. That I could be wrong on that, so don't quote me. Um, but she is also taken out. Okay, so you have an effective coup at this point where the military leadership is now, or the governmental leadership is out of power. They are killed. They're taken out. Um, and you have no real governmental structure in Rwanda at this point. Okay, uh, the plane that crashes again, you get the French are the first on the scene. They don't really let anyone in to investigate what actually happened. Even to this day, okay, 2022, no one actually knows the true cause of the plane crash. There are a number of different speculations. Uh, if you get a question talking about the plane crash, I would heavily recommend looking at multiple different perspectives, giving arguments of who might have been involved in that plane crash and why, okay? Uh, it was not an accident. We know that much. It didn't just crash. It was shot down. Who shot it down? We don't know. Okay, one argument is that it was Tutsis trying to get revenge, take out this individual, okay? The other argument is that it was members of the um, Hutu power movement who did not like the more moderate stance that Harbi Ramana was taking after signing the Ashura Accords. 
He was trying to kind of come to a more middle of the ground. They wanted a more extremist Hutu in power. The Tutsis are cockroaches. They don't deserve to live. Some people argue that he, or the Hutu power movement had him taken out as a way of stopping him from making any more concessions and getting a more extremist Hutu group in power. Okay? Any questions on that? We're good so far. Okay. Uh, we're also going to get um, the RPF. Again, the RPF is out of the country, okay, led by Paul Kagame. Kagame is going to ultimately become the president of Rwanda uh, after the genocide and pretty much until he doesn't want to be president anymore. Um, okay, leading the RPF. The RPF, Rwandan Patriotic Front, is going to be the ones who are going to kind of slowly start coming in from outside the country. Um, I believe they were in Burundi or Uganda. Um, I don't remember the top of my head, but they're coming in to the country, uh, slowly kind of trying to take back and stop the genocide from happening. Um, so do understand the role they play. There are some, uh, when they start coming into the country, you have a number of Hutu who start leaving the country and fleeing, fearing reprisal killings of basically, uh, you killed a bunch of us, we're going to go kill a bunch of you. Um, there were some instances of that kind of stuff happening. Um, but to a much less degree than was happened by the Interra Hamwe um, and the killing of, of the Tutsis. Race plays a large role in this as well. There's a lot of racial tensions. Um, the other thing that's really important to understand is it wasn't just done um, like by certain individuals. A lot of people took part in this, and it was massive killing on a really, really large scale. So it was a lot of people killed in a short period of time, uh, neighbors killing neighbors, um, all these different things right like that happening. Okay, uh, So when it comes to moving on afterwards, this is part of the problem right through there. Uh, the role of the media, there was this whole kind of belief of could the, uh, could the West have actually done something to stop this? If they could, why didn't they? You get the Belgian soldiers who were captured by the Interra Hamwe, um, who were then killed, which makes the United Nations decide to pull out troops. Uh, and not partake in what's happening here and really get on the ground and try to stop something from happening in Rwanda. Um, you get outside countries that could go in and don't. You get the French, for example, that are evacuating French citizens, but they're not protecting anyone who comes to there for humanitarian aid. Okay, you got Tutsis who are going there saying, let us in, they're going to kill us. The French do not let them in. Um, the United States okay, is kind of suffering from the Somali syndrome. Uh, in 1992, I believe, or 93, you have um, like Black Hawk Down, okay, Mogadishu. You have the American forces in Somalia and the conflict going on there. It goes horribly. It looks really bad for the United States. It looks really bad for President Clinton. The United States doesn't want to get involved in another conflict that doesn't directly influence them. Therefore, they stay out despite um, knowing what's going on. Okay, Western organizations are very uh, careful to not call this a genocide. If they genocide, they have a moral obligation to get involved. If they call it a humanitarian crisis, they don't necessarily have to. Okay, remember that cartoon of the lady waving, like or like grasping for help, and they're like, "Oh, she's saying goodbye." Uh, it's that kind of mentality. You could also look at the issue of race right here. You've got Western countries, predominantly white, and in Rwanda, a country, um, people who are black. Do they really care because of their race? There's that question going on right through here, especially when you compare it with the situation in Kosovo, a country of predominantly people who are white, looking at people who are black. Okay, a good modern comparison is looking at Europe's response to refugees coming out of Ukraine compared to refugees coming out of the Middle East and North Africa. Really willing to accept one, not so willing to accept the other group. Okay, question. I would try not to compare it with the more modern stuff. Um, I would, in your head, do that because it'll if you have an understanding of modern stuff, it'll help you understand it better. Don't actually write it, but if you can see a parallel between what happened then and what ha what's happening now, definitely use that to inform your writing um, because it's there to help you. Like use that to help you, if that makes sense. Um, Okay, so that's kind of understanding the Western response to this. Um, ultimately, Clinton, for example, is going to state that he his biggest regret of his presidency was not getting involved in this. Um, there is some argument, too, that the lack of Western response to this is one of the big motivators for Western response into Kosovo later on. Um, rape is another significant thing to talk about right through here. Uh, you have a number of individuals who commit rape 
um, on Hutu women, or sorry, on Tutsi women. Uh, this is done for a number of reasons. One, the power aspect of rape. You have a lot more power over the person who is a victim. Um, it's a way of doing that. Uh, there is the psychological aspect of that as well, um, where you can go and really degrade someone to the core. Uh, so you're not just physically killing them, you're kind of killing their soul, their, what their being. Um, it's not about the sexual gratification, it's about the, the degradation um, of an individual's dignity. Okay, it's an attack on their dignity. Uh, that is the reason this is going to be happening so prevalent at this time. Okay, so you do have this in, this this happening. Um, women, young children as well. Um, it's not just like women of, of age. There's children this is happening to as well. Um, again, it's an attack on society. It's an attack on the culture. Does that make sense? Yes. It's part of it, yeah. I mean, it wasn't just for that. It's a power thing. Um, if any of you are in psychology, you can kind of look at some of the mindset of, of an abusive individual. Um, it's not just... The vast majority of people who commit sexual violence are not necessarily do like especially rape. It's not just for the gratification. It's a matter of power. You have power over that individual. Um, they can't do anything. They're incredibly vulnerable. Um, there's also the, the social stigma associated with that aspect as well. It's a bit of both. Yeah, it would probably, I mean, I don't think there's an easy way to say it happens because of this, because of this, because of this. But I think there's a number of factors that would certainly be one. Okay. Uh, the international community, as I talked about, doesn't really do much. Um, the UN um, Assistance Mission for Rwanda okay, is there. But again, after the Belgian soldiers are killed, the UN basically says, stand down, don't do anything to protect their own. Um, there's a lot of different things happening right through here. <coughs> um, reasons for inaction. I've kind of already touched on some of these reasons. Um, doesn't want to make the situation worse. You've got the racial aspects going on here. Rwanda doesn't have a lot of resources that outside Western countries really desire. So there's some of that influence. Well, why get involved when you don't have anything to gain from the situation? Um, France, okay, historically had kind of supported the Hutus. Why does France want to get involved here? Well, they don't really want to. These are former people they've supported. Um, okay, so France kind of stays back. Belgium, again, kind of made the situation in the first place. Belgium doesn't really get involved here. You've got Belgian soldiers on the ground who are killed in the United States who has the ability to go in and do something but does not. Okay. We'll talk later. Okay. Uh, impact, Kate, social impact. You get the refugee crisis. People are leaving Rwanda. Okay. Initially, Tutsis trying to get out of the country because they're going to be killed if they don't. They're going to neighboring countries. You're going to then have the, uh, once the RPF comes in and establishes authority, you're going to have a lot of Hutu start leaving the country as a way of trying to avoid reprisal killings. Um, yeah, into the Congo. Okay. Um, justice and reconciliation. A lot of people who committed these actions during the genocide were not ultimately punished for them. Um, there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, the leaders, for the most part, were punished. Okay. We can look at Kagame. Um, Kagame, obviously, as a Tutsi, um, was not committing acts of genocide. However, there were allegations of the RPF and members under his authority did some pretty unsavory things. Um, so we have that kind of stuff going on. Uh, do you punish the victims um, at a time for this? Yes or no. Um, ideally, if they did something wrong, you should. Does it actually happen in practice? Well, no. Um, part of it is a lack of evidence on some of these things um, of people who did something, but there's not enough to convict them. The other issue here is simply the number of people who committed these horrible acts and the number of uh, prisons and judges and attorneys in Rwanda. It w there was not physically enough people in the country to actually prosecute everyone for what happened. Okay, they wanted to, but they simply could not do it. Um, so as a result of this, you have individuals who partook in the genocide, Hutu, or Hutu who were in Rwanda living next to people who they might have killed their relatives. 
um, and they didn't really have anything from there. The other thing to say here is if you arrest everyone and put them in jail, you run the risk potentially of creating a conflict um, where you have a large number of people in prison, uh, and that can kind of create this social division as well, uh, which could lead to a similar crisis happening again down the road. Uh, a good example of this is kind of think World War I. You punish Germany really, really bad. Um, what happens? You get Hitler and the Nazis coming to power. It's kind of like, do you punish them again really, really bad, or do you try to have a more moderate base and try to hope this doesn't happen again? Okay, you're going to get something like that. You do, do you get the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda prosecuting these individuals for their war crimes um, and what happened, why they did this, um, all these different things right through here. The full extent of how far it went. Did it go far enough? Did it not go far enough? Um, what actually happens to the individuals? Uh, and you're going to have this crisis kind of, um, you're going to get the RPF, as they talked about, coming to power. Okay, uh, Kagame. Uh, leading it even to this day, still is the leader of Rwanda, tends to be very popular in Rwanda. A lot of people kind of see him as the one who led uh, the resistance to the genocide, stopping it in the first place. Um, but you're also going to have the crisis kind of bleed over into the DRC, okay, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Zaire, as it was known that time. Um, you get major crises going on there that comes directly from this. Okay, so the big thing to kind of understand if we're going to put this all together is really there's a major connection between imperialism, uh, this power struggle between imperial countries uh, and the country that was being colonized, and how that kind of bleeds into the ethnic tension, which really, uh, through the nationalistic kind of ideology, goes into this. Okay, uh, does anyone have any questions? Aisha. Yes. There was a lot. Um, there wasn't enough people in the, in the country to prosecute them. Um, and then the other idea, the other, yeah, the other idea was, okay, so you start doing this. Um, yes, this person committed murder, but if you put them in jail, like maybe you put the man of the family in jail, and now there's a woman without a husband. You've got children there without a father going to grow up in probably a worse social sit uh, setting than if they had the family, um, the whole kind of nuclear family, so to speak, around if this is happening, is that going to help the country develop and grow, or is this just going to kind of kick the can down the road to potentially have another crisis later on? Any other questions? Okay, so that is going to be the summary of uh, conflict intervention, Rwanda. Um, everything going directly from the main key points. Uh, if you have questions, if you're listening to this online, add a comment. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you later. <laughs>